2 Timothy chapter 1, also from verse 8 all the way to the end. And it says, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but he has now been revealed to the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. This is why I am suffering as I am. Yet, this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard me, what you heard from me, keep as pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard a good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant him, grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. You may be seated. Amen. <clears throat> so before I jump into tonight's message, what I believe the Lord put on my heart, there's something that the Lord put on my heart <clears throat> maybe a few weeks ago, and I didn't get a chance to share it. I got a chance to share it at youth. But it's something that as I was maybe thinking about or pursuing how come we can get promptings of the Holy Spirit and we act upon them and then fail. So as I was thinking about it, I had this impression, call it revelation, whatever it may be, that really has helped me and I'm hoping it would help some of us. And as I was thinking about it, I'm going, well, how come, why is that the case? I think so many of us get impressions of the Holy Spirit, we're, we're led in certain directions, and we act upon them. And then we act upon them, and then maybe we fail in some things, or, or some things don't go maybe what we hoped, or how we hoped they, they would have went. And then we say, God, what happened? What's going on? Why didn't it go this way? Where did we go wrong? Didn't you tell me to do this? And yes, he did. He did tell us to do certain things, but this thing where I think we miss, or often my life specifically, and maybe in some of your lives, is this. It's that moment where best I can relate it to is Moses, for example, when God tells him, he's kind of, God is kind of annoyed with his own people, and he says, listen, I'm going to prepare everything for you. I'm going to send an angel with you, but I'm not going to go with you. And then Moses says, Lord, if, if your presence doesn't go before us, then we're not going to go either. And I think that's the biggest reason. It's that instead of, so God, we have prompted in the Holy Spirit. We're led by the Holy Spirit in a certain direction, and then we lead. We act in that direction, but we lead without the leading of the Holy Spirit himself. And then we're left with with the Holy Spirit, because when we lead, that means the Holy Spirit is following. And then what happens is the Holy Spirit becomes the cleanup crew for us. But who do you think he's going to clean, clean, clean up with? With us. We become his broom. And we call, it, we call it building up character. We call it perseverance. But why does it have to be like that? I mean, the fact that our minds are not seared completely and we know how to apologize from our mistakes and maybe apologize to people who may have hurt in the promptings or maybe in their certain directions. The good thing is that our minds is not seared. But why do we always have to be the broom? Rather, I would say, when the promptings of the Holy Spirit and the leadings of the Holy Spirit, we say, Holy Spirit first, I'll follow you. And when he goes first, what happens for, with us? we pick up on the blessings, on the victories, 
on the benefits. Why? Because we listened. And even in the promptings, we allowed him to lead. And I am hoping that it's not just for me something that I need to get together in, in my life, in whatever I do for the Lord, but I'm hoping that this could be something that can be encouraging to all of us, that when we get impressions and promptings of the Holy Spirit, it's also wise to say, Lord, I'm going to act upon it. But if you don't go, I'm not going to go. If you don't go, Lord, forget it. Your angel is not enough. As cool as that would be, it's not enough. I want your presence to go first. That's something that's been on my heart and I really wanted to share. And Maybe it wasn't just for me, maybe for somebody else too. But keep in mind, allow him to lead in whatever he prompts you to do. Amen. Now, as we get into the text tonight, um, 2 Timothy is mostly known as a farewell letter or a personal letter to Timothy. 1 Timothy, for example, it was more church specific, like this is how you should do church or how things should be in the church. But this second letter to Timothy, it's more of a farewell. It's more personal to Timothy himself. And also, I think because Paul knows that his time is very close and he doesn't have much and he's like eager to, to invest or to download into somebody else his life or what he's learned or what he's discovered, what he's been through and he's pouring into Timothy. Because we know that based on the historian Eusebius, shortly after this, he gets decapitated in the time of Nero. So it's, it's, it's more like a, a farewell to somebody very personal next to him. So when we read 2 Timothy, you have to read it as that to get a full glimpse of it. It's a farewell. It's a personal letter to a person, to somebody else. As we would write a letter to somebody else that's very personal to us, and we know maybe our end is near, or, and we write in such a way. And that's what Paul does to Timothy. So it starts with verse 8, and it says, Do not be ashamed. Now, this is consistent with, co consistent with Paul's teaching because he constantly tells us, don't be ashamed of the gospel. We have Romans 1.16 where it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because of the power that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. You know, you know the scripture. It's consistent to the way Paul lives in regards to this gospel. Do not be ashamed of it. And it's sad, as, as, as Pastor Nutsu mentioned, it's true. Many people today are ashamed of the gospel, as if it's something out of date, something long ago. And if you're not, in, if you're not like keeping in step with what's going on in the world, somehow the gospel is foolishness. And, 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 it, and not just that, you'd be, you'd be shocked to find out, church, that even youth who are pastors' children, do not understand the gospel and question it and are ashamed of it. I personally know youth like that who just don't ever got a glimpse of it, which rather they want to look sophisticated and bring all the sophisticated arguments. And I'm like, why are we arguing about this? This is nonsense. Don't ever be ashamed of the gospel. It's powerful. It's the way, only way you will find yourself in. Amen. Then he also says, do not be ashamed of me. Interesting. Do not be ashamed of me. It's almost like, hey, Timothy, I'm in prison. Don't let this thing shake you up. And I can't help think about uh, John the baptizer, not the Baptist. He was not a Baptist. He was a baptizer or the immerser. We're Pentecostals, okay? No. Uh, John the baptizer, when he was in prison, he has this message. He says, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah... He sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect somebody else? Interesting. It's not that he's in prison. I can't help think about a little bit relate to John the Baptist. He's in prison right now. And he's going, man, is, is this shameful for me? Like, is it shame that I'm in here? I'm not sure. I need assurance. Why am I here, Jesus? Why am I here? And then we know that Jesus, in a very respectful manner, says that he is the greatest man born of a woman. He doesn't say, hey, man, don't ever think about me. Don't forget who I am. No, he doesn't say that. He's, he, Jesus was not ashamed of him. But Paul takes a different approach on that. Don't be ashamed of me. Because he says, don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner. 
key word. I have learned this season, in this season of my life to focus on all the words that I read. Because if you focus on all the words that you read in the scripture, you'll discover more of the scripture. He doesn't say, don't be ashamed of me, their prisoner, the one who have put me in prison. But he says, don't be ashamed of me, whose prisoner? Jesus is prisoner. Interesting perspective. Don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner. But again, this is the consistent theme of Paul. 2 Corinthians 2.14, I touched on this last time I preached. He says, be, but thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ. In Christ's triumphal procession as captives. Do you understand? Paul has, has, has no shame in saying I'm a prisoner of Christ. And he has no shame of saying I'm a captive of Christ. He's getting somewhere, you'll we'll see. Then he also, as you read in, in other um, letters, other epistles he writes, he often refers to himself, I, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Or another translation of Romans 1.1, 1, 1, a slave of Christ. Or another translation, a bondservant of Christ. What's he saying? I don't belong to me. It's what he's saying. He's saying, I do not belong to you, to this world, Timothy. I belong to to another. I am a captive of Christ, glory to God. I'm a prisoner of Christ, glory to God. I'm a servant of Christ, glory to God. I'm a bond servant of Christ, glory to God. Meaning, these shackles are accessories for my prison outfit. They're, they're bracelets. They're accessories. If you were to ask Richard Wurmbrand, he would say they're instruments. Because when you're a prisoner of Christ, nothing can imprison you. What can imprison you if you're already a prisoner to Christ? What can take you captive if you're already his captive? What can you be enslaved to if you're already his? Nothing. And this is what Paul is saying to Timothy. Listen, I am not, a, don't be ashamed of me. Wait, wait a second. This is glorious. Do you understand? These people, in their imagination, thinks they got me, but they don't. They don't have me. He has me. There's no shame of what's going on here, Paul. He has me. Glory to the living God for that. And I can't help not think about the, the theme we just had at Winterfest about faithful in the fire and the passages that were, that were read. And I also want to come along with Pastor Adi and say, man, Harmony worship, outstanding. Glory to God. I was in the back with, for a quick moment with, with um, Andre, and as soon as the, our worship team started going, started worshiping, people couldn't, Andre kept going, man, these hairs need to start, sit down, hairs, stop. You know, it's like there was something special in that place. And I do believe, I'm not just saying it because I'm super biased to our worship team. I'm saying it because I truly believe the Prince of God has anointed that worship that night. So glory to God for that. But going back to the theme, I'm, going, I'm thinking about in the same mindset of what it means to be a prisoner to Christ, right? What does it mean to be? And, and there was a clear picture in that passage they read about uh, Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 to 35. It's not going to be on the screen. I, I didn't meet the deadline. But it says that king, the king Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, in amazement, and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up? Think of the wording. Thank you. That they were tied up. Weren't there three men that were what? Tied up. Look what it says. And, that, and, and threw in the fire. They replied, certainly your majesty. He said, look, I see four walking around in the fire, unbound. Think about that. Unbound unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Because it doesn't matter what's going on in this messed up world. He cannot have you if you're already his. And even though you might be going through the toughest moments of life, there still could be a whole bunch of liberty through it. You understand? A whole bunch of liberty even through this. I heard many people when, when I wasn't yet saved, you know, going to church. And when I was in, and I was thinking of, I was having my fun and, and being free. I just want to be free for a while because I got time, you know. 
That's the whole, that's the foolish, that's a foolish thought. I have time. I can still be free and live. That's garbage. And I used to think like that. And I got to think, I'm free right now. Meaning, I, what I meant by that was I am free to do whatever my flesh desired. That's what he meant by that. Not free. But not thinking that my freedom was captivity. Slavery to something else. Because there's always an altar, guys. There's always an altar. You sacrifice on God's altar or, or, or Satan's altar. But there's always an altar in your life. No matter what. Your life is a living sacrifice somewhere and to something. So with that mindset, we think we're free by doing whatever we want. And as if, as if, I, would, as if, if I would give my life to Christ, somehow I would be chained down. I wouldn't be able to have fun. That's what I was thinking. I can't have fun no more. You know, I got to be all good, sing Christian songs, whatever, act proper. So is my mindset. Without thinking and understanding that if I'm in Christ, Job says, when, when, when Job has a conversation with God, and he, he tries to ask God, why in the world is all these things happening? And, and then God lets him have it. Basically tells him, even if I told you, you wouldn't get it. But he says this one line. Job, were you there when I drew the boundary lines? What am I, what am I trying to say with this? In Christ, he is the one who makes the boundary lines. Meaning, if I become a captive and a prisoner of Christ, he is the unlimited God. He was the one who knows where this line begins, where that line ends. Meaning in him, I can be the most free and I can experience the most liberty that I can ever experience in my life on this earth. Only in him. So therefore, the mindset that I can't be free if I just repent, because that means I would have to give us sinful fleshly desires. Sorry. But you can experience the most freedom in who he is. Therefore, in hard times, you can be free. Liberty. Unchained and unbound. It doesn't matter what times you go through. And in Christ Jesus, you can experience the most of yourself. You want to discover yourself? Do you want to discover your limits? In Christ. A li an unlimited God. That's where you can discover your limits. Not on your own self. Not in your own desires. Your foolishness. So that's another thing that I'm thinking about this. About this liberty perspective and this prisoner thing, man, I'm, I'm happy to call myself a captive of Christ. He, he sure, I, I'm definitely a captive because I was a captive to Satan and Christ went straight to Satan, knocked him out and took me out of his hands and therefore I'm a captive, glory to God. I have no, no shame in saying that and I believe in Paul, if he can speak to our terms today, he would say the same thing. Listen, what Christ has done, I'm definitely his prisoner. Glory to God for that. Now that's just verse 8. All right, there's so much to go. Now verses 9 and 10, it says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ before the beginning of time. Now, if you are saved here tonight, and I pray all of you are saved, if not, you need to get saved. You are called to a holy living. Meaning what God saves, He calls. Meaning if He saved you, that means He has something specific for you to do. Amen? Amen. And He calls not just to any sort of calling, but a holy calling. Now according to the New Testament, a holy to means to be separated from something. Separated from the world. Set apart. In the Old Testament, He was to be set apart for something. And I believe in Christ, both apply. First of all, God calls us to a holy living to be separated from the world, which is unholy, and set apart for something glorious in His hands. Just to give you a few examples, we have John the Baptist. He's set apart. Samson, he was set apart. And what glorious things they have done. So I'm going to say to all of us saved believers, there is a calling over your life. And it's a glorious and a holy calling. And I urge you to discover it, whatever that may be. Then the calling, it may not always be visible, like me. It may not always be seen and appreciated. We all have different callings. 
Some of your callings may be ushering. I discovered the art of ushering and it gets overlooked and, and maybe not appreciated, but that's hard work. Saying hi to people who ignore you and act like you don't exist. It's not the easiest thing, but glory to God, it's on to Christ. Amen? Even that can be holy and glorious in itself. So yes, even for s such little things, you, there's still a glorious calling for those who are saved. Amen. And I also want to encourage you, don't be happy with just being saved. It's like saying, I just want to not go to hell. Why? <laughs> it's like saying, in a, in a financial perspective, I just don't want to be poor. Why don't you want to be rich and have stuff? In the same way, people who are saved, it's like, I just want to go to hell and experience hellfire. Okay, why not experience the goodness and the and abundant life of God? And why not experience everything good He has to give you? Why just be afraid of hell? And not just that, don't you think Christ wants people who truly love Him? People who are truly in love with Him? Not people who are scared of hell running to Him. He's just your Savior. When you truly love Him for who He is, then you get under His Lordship. And when you get under His Lordship, then you get stuff from the King's hands. Because He's your Lord now. So why not pursue that? Not just being saved, but pursue the callings He has over His life. Glory to God. Also moving on, as, as Pastor Nutu touched on, he said, this grace was from the beginning of time, meaning the grace through the gospel. Why? In other words, the gospel is plan A, not plan B. You understand? Many of us think like, oh, God had to send Jesus because no, he was not taken off guard. He was always plan A. That's why I rejoice for what he's done for me because I wasn't an afterthought. You understand? I wasn't an afterthought. I was plan A. Glory to the living God. As we keep going, also I wonder something that the Timothy, I mean, Paul reminds Timothy about as we often, um, you know, describe the gospel as the gospel of message, which as we often express at communion, kind of reminds him of revealing through the appearance of our Savior to Christ Jesus. We often do this at communion. And he also has this one line that says, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, if you just briefly skim over it, it's, it's nice. But listen to what it says. Has brought life and immortality to light. Meaning through the gospel, life itself and immortality was able to truly be seen, lit, lit up, only through the gospel message. Why is that significant? significant? Because we have Hinduism, who talks about life and immortality. We have Muslims, Islam, who talks about life and immortality. And maybe I've missed some other nonsense that's been out in the market for some quite some time. But the truth is this. He says the only way you can truly light up life and immortality is to the gospel of the living God. Meaning to this statement alone puts to shame the other relig religions, life and immortality. Because he's saying only through this, life and immortality itself can light up, can be truly seen for what it is. Glory to God. And now we're going to keep going because um, time is closing in and I'm probably going to borrow some, some minutes from, from uh, uh, Florine Gale because he's kind of in debt. And I'm going to keep going forward a little bit. And he also goes to verses 11 and 12. And it says, And of the gospel I was appointed a herald, and an apostle, and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet again, he says, there's no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and, and am convinced that he is able to guard or have entrusted him on that day. Again, what's he saying? He's saying that no matter what I'm going through right now, no matter what I'm dealing with right now, it has not robbed me of the calling. You understand? It, your circumstances, your problems does not rob you of your calling. He's saying, I'm still an apostle. I'm still a herald 
of the gospel, someone who proclaims it out loud. I'm still a teacher. These chains do not rob me of my identity in Christ Jesus. Something that I've also seen as an ushered bird's eye view um, that also me and Andre were discussing was this, uh, how this, I don't know if I should say this, but how this society and the trends of this world has robbed youth, specifically the boys, of their uniqueness. What do I mean by that? There was literally two hairstyles in that whole 2,000 people. <laughs> Color scheme was always on point. The 90s um, clothing is coming back strong. And that's all you saw. And we also saw this small little detail how they even fixed their hairstyle. It's very simple, extremely simple. All you have to do is look at your phone, go through your hair, your hand through your hair up fast and bring it right down. And it's done. Very quick. And I'm thinking, what in the world has this world done? They have it good. Most of those kids there, their parents pay their way there. They have no struggles. They have no things to deal with. How, what, what robbed them of their uniqueness? What robbed them of their uniqueness? And Paul here, he's in chains. He has every reason to complain, yet he says, hold on, I am still, I'm not a prisoner as the world might see, I am still a herald, an apostle, and a teacher of the gospel. What I'm trying to say is it's important to have an identity. I know sometimes this has been used and abused, this word, I have find your identity in Christ, because you have some people who just don't know what they're talking about, and they throw it loosely out there. No, it's super important that we get a grasp of it. It's important to know who you are. It's important, important to discover your calling and walk in it, and don't allow circumstances to rob you of that, whether good or bad. Amen. Glory to God. Also, another thing is Paul, we can, we, can, we can see his true source of identity in verse 12. He says this in verse 12. Um, the second part of it, he says, Because I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced, okay, that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him in that, until that day. Who is he talking about? <clears throat> God. And what has he entrusted to God? What can the most perfect human being on planet earth, so to speak, can entrust to God? What is it? Himself. The only thing I can entrust to God is me. What can I give him that he doesn't already have? He's God. In other words, me. I entrust myself to him and I'm convinced that he'll take care of it. And that's his source of identity. And he goes, and he goes back from verse 8. I'm a prisoner of, I'm his prisoner. He keeps this theme going in, his, in, in, in this passage. I entrust him. What I've entrusted to him. And you know that one thing God can never do. There's one thing God cannot do. And it's stop being faithful. So if you want to entrust yourself into him, let me tell you something. He'll never fail you. Never. It's something he can't do. Glory to God that he cannot do something, which is this, stop being faithful. That means I can, I can say, Lord, I'm going to trust myself, my, my family, my ministry, my calling. I'm going to trust it to you. It is, it is the best invest, investment. Not Bitcoin, not Sheba, which we all lost in. It's yourself. Entrust yourself to him. And he will guard it until the end. Glory to God. Verses 13 and 14, I, I, I don't think I can say any, any better than Pastor Nutsu did, but I'll try. It says, What well, you have heard from me keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard a good deposit. I mean, the, what I've downloaded into you to this letter, guard it. It's life and death, Timothy. Guard it. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit which lives in us. Many say, listen, uh, 
Timothy, there's a lot of stuff I told you. A lot. It's very important. I hope we can be of people who are so, who are so convinced what we know and how we lived that I can say to the next person, take it. It's good. It passes. It's authentic. It's clear. I can fully and, and, and pass it down because I know and I'm convinced that I lived in such a way that you can carry on. Because this is the theme of the, of the whole series, passing down a legacy. This is what he's doing right here. He's passing down a legacy. You know, as parents, for, I mean, as we had parents, as if parents still alive, we know that what they've entrusted in us, we, we boast about. Like for me, I think I had the best dad in, on planet Earth. He, he, you know, he applied the law when, when needed. He definitely did not. He made sure he applied it. Glory to God. Um, but he was, he always, he was very fair. He said, Christy, if you haven't worked for it, don't touch it. Whatever you work for, you can have. He instilled those values. Don't, don't compromise. I remember one time when the economy was going good, some, somebody told me, Christy, I know how you can make $10,000 in a month. And I'm like, okay, how can I do it? He said, here, I'm going to buy this house, put it on your name. I'm going to pull out 150 grand. I'm going to give you 10,000. And I was like, man, this sounds good. Call my dad. He's like, Christy, this is fraud. This is fraud. Is this how you want to live your life? And those kind of values he entrusted in me, hard work, sincerity, be pure, don't compromise. It's something he's done to the T. He even bought me this microphone because he thinks I'm the best Romanian English preacher. And because he's my dad, I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> but that's who he was. That's who he is. Then my mother passed down to me what it means to pray. Pray for your children. Man, you, you do not miss prayer. Me, even my dad listened to him when he said, Aurel, it's time to pray. He was right on his knees next to us and praying, and, and she would say the prayers out loud, out loud, and we would follow her prayers till the end. Some of us would fall asleep half through because she wanted to touch on everybody who's all over the world by name. And, but that was the value that she instilled, many things, a great legacy. And I can't help not see Paul, Paul doing the same thing in Timothy. You can trust it. I lived it. I've experienced it. I pass it down to you. I pray we become a people who are willingly passing down a great legacy, an authentic legacy, a trustworthy legacy uh, uh, that can be, that's been proven and tested and authentic and pass it down to our own. Amen? Can we say amen to that? And last thing he, briefly, he touches on this life. You're also going to have disappointments. You're, gonna, you're also going to have People who are disloyal, who will desert you, and people who are going to be loyal to you. It comes with, with both, unfortunately. And he says, be careful. And I believe he's telling us, as a people, sometimes we have a tendency to cling on to people so much. So much. And we put so much trust and hope. Pastors, leaders, evangelists, influencers. And they disappoint us, and then our world falls apart. The Bible says, cursed is the man who trusts in another man. Do not put so much. Love people, invest in them, treat other people uh, better than you would treat yourself. But don't put so much that when disappointment comes, it'll crumble you. I remember um, the great Ravi Zacharias. I loved how he spoke. Man, I read his books. I loved how he always laid a smack down on people when he debated on them. He was so wise. I feel like he had an answer to everything. And when I heard the terrible news about him, for two days I think I'm going, God, what's going on? What is going on? Like, do I trust anything now, what he said? Sometimes if you put so much trust in what man says, when he falls, it'll crumble everything he said. Everything. I think we have to be very careful with that one. But there's also people who are dear to us, 
who um, are always consistent, who put a, put a value on guys. Value people who maybe other people don't see much of them because they're not somebody big and famous. Value them. They value people. I remember, um, um, and I want to worship him to come up. I remember in my beginning of my conversion, the process of my conversion, I would go to church and I would have what I would call true elders in my life. People didn't care much for them, okay? But there was these people where when they said, Christy, I love you, and they would say, I love you, because with an accent a little bit, people laughed. But when he said that and hugged me, I knew he meant it. Like there was a love that was contagiously felt. Where I, when, it, when if I was feeling down, I would search for this man so he can sell, tell me those three words, I love you, because I needed encouragement. Or there was people that I would go to prayer meetings because I was hungry for God in the beginning, super hungry, I went to every prayer meeting I could find. Remember this other um, elder of the church that would call, didn't really see well and hear well, and he would always save a spot for me at prayer. And he would say, can you hold the harfa for me? He knew what I was going through. He knew I was new, he knew I was fresh. But there was some the way he, he mentored and poured into me that was significant. I'll never forget these two people in my life. It wasn't the famous pastors. It wasn't uh, the ones who you think they should. It was the ones I never expected who made the most influence in my life, who impacted me the most in my conversion years. People who said, hold this for me so I can sing. I know he could hold it by himself, but he just made me do it so I can sit next to him. Something about when I say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm leaving, and he looked at me with tears in my eyes, in his eyes, and was super, and I knew he was, he, he genuinely will miss me when he said he would miss me. People like that. Uh, it's not always the, the people who you'd expect. It's always the people who you don't expect that will pull through. So I want to leave you with these things of Paul's 2 Timothy chapter 1 ending. And I would like to, uh, like to invite you all to please stand up as we sing our last song of worship. Uh, I'm not going to call you to something specific. I will just call you to worship. Just to worship. Worship is super powerful. Raise your voice. Align your heart and your mind with your voice. Not just your voices. It has to, all three of these things, be uh, in with one accord. If you want to pray, pray. If you want to sing, sing. But whatever you do in this time, Give glory to God. Amen.